Good morning, good morning, good morning, folks. How are you all doing this morning? I hope you are well. Um, give us a thumbs up if you're uh, if you're live and well, and you're in the chat. Give a thumbs up if your day is going well, folks. Welcome to another Shopper Intelligence Live session. I think I just saw a hands up. That's terrific as well. If you've got a hands up, that's also good. Uh, welcome, folks. Uh, my name is David. Some of you may know me already. And uh, plenty of you will know my co-host today, Andrew Arnold. Good morning, Double A. How are you doing? Good morning, David. Or afternoon from where I am, actually. Indeed, indeed. Good afternoon. We have a lot of Kiwis on, on the line. Maybe give us a thumbs up. Hello, Rowan. Hello, Ronell. Give us a thumbs up if you're uh, in New Zealand this afternoon as well. Um, right. So let's get into it. What are we here to discuss today? This session is all about elevating your performance, raising the bar, kicking some goals. That's what this is all about. So if you are operating in the grocery, in the liquor, in the pharmacy world, and you want some ideas, uh, you want some guidance, maybe a guiding hand to help you get to that next place, wherever that is, then you are in the right place today. Whether you are currently uh, a subscriber to Shop Intelligence or not, is irrelevant today, whether you work for a supplier or a retailer, doesn't matter. There is good value on offer here today for you. Hello, Kieran. Ah, good to see you. Simon's there. Terrific. Well done, Simon. Thank you very much. Chat is working well. Um, what does matter, though, what's really, really important to hold with you uh, for the next 40 minutes or so is two things. Firstly, a level of curiosity. You've joined this session already, so you must be reasonably curious at least to uh, to understand what we're going to talk about. So hold on to that curiosity, hold on to that growth mindset um, and have an openness to doing things better. That's crucial. I'm sure you have that right now. And number two, come with a belief that in order to do things better, <laughs> excuse me, you need to collaborate effectively with your trading partners. So growth mindset, <clears throat> collaboration mindset. And um, why don't we get the ball rolling? Let's uh, let's see if we can get some more people involved. In the chat, tell me what's the one thing that you enjoy most about your job? Okay, we're going to explore a couple of the, the challenges in this live webcast today. A couple of the things that you might face in your job, which maybe aren't always as enjoyable. So let's start with a positive. Pop it in the chat, short and sweet. What is the one thing that is most enjoyable about your job? Sherry, straight off the mark, launching MPD. Alison, wonderful, discovering insights. Yes, we love that as well. Fabulous. Um, and with that, I'll take the opportunity to uh, introduce ourselves and very briefly, a little bit more detail. So uh, I know Andrew has a list as long as your arm of things that he loves about his job. And I'm going to put that question to him as I say again, good morning, Andrew, how are you doing? Good afternoon, David. And <laughs> good afternoon. It is lovely to be here with everybody uh, this afternoon or, or this morning, if you're over, over in Australia. Uh, what do I love about my job? I, I've got to say the, the biggest thing I love about about what I do here at Shopper Intelligence is just the fact that no one day is the same from from you know one day to the next because we have such a wide range of suppliers and retailers that we work with. There's so many categories that we do work on. There's so many business issues and and and, and the, the likes of that that we help out with. It's just really refreshing that you know one day you can be working on something completely different to what you're working on 24 hours ago. I I, I love that about this. I love it. Love you, Andrew. Very on message. Very on message. Um, now, Andrew, just quickly, you've been uh, you've been around a number of years. You've seen the industry from many different angles over those years. We will obviously talk a lot today about putting shoppers at the heart of the conversation today. Why do you think the shopper then is sometimes sometimes still something of an afterthought? Why do you why do you um, why do you think we still see that from time to time? Well, I think at the moment, um, the, the biggest thing that, that is pushing Shopper to the sidelines uh, more often than, than, it, than it needs to be is the fact that we're just in such a difficult environment from an economic point of view. I mean, a lot of the conversations that are happening with with retailers at the moment, um, and that they would be probably be the first to admit this as well, is about how do we deliver more value 
to, to the people who are buying the products at, at the store. So, you know, you know, discussions about margin, discussions about, you know, pricing hierarchies and all the rest of it, they seem to be taking precedence at the moment in, in, a, in a lot of areas. Now, I, and I, I totally understand why that is the case, but the, the real thing about Shopper is that, you know, Shopper is not a short-term play. Shopper is something that you absolutely have to be talking about on a constant basis to actually derive the best benefit out of it. It's not something that you just, you know, chuck in there as as an afterthought when you're, you know, doing a, a presentation to a retail and saying, oh, and by the way, the shopper thinks this. And I'll be the first to admit, I've done that in my previous careers. I mean, you lose the fact I've been around since Adam was a schoolboy, David. So thank you for basically saying obliquely that I'm old. Um, but I have been around a long time. And I did that myself. I mm -hmm. freely admit I did that myself. But, uh, you know, that's because I wasn't taking a long-term view. Indeed, indeed. Yes, you're right. I think I'd agree with that. Um, difficult times and and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, avenues to explore and a lot of different routes to go into your, um, your trading conversations with. Uh, so we will touch on that. We will touch a number of times on the fact that Shopper is not a project. The more you use, the more you put shoppers at the heart of your conversation, the easier it gets, the benefits um, multiply. It's exponential as you go through your planning year, the more you use it. So we will touch on that again in a moment. Uh, I was just going to add that probably the thing that I hands down enjoy the most about my job is something we're, we're going to refer to in the, the third use case towards the end of this session. And it was a, a bit of feedback that I got from somebody after we ran a workshop uh, they phoned me up and they said it was about mid morning and they said to me that they had only just made it to their desk the day after we ran the workshop because they'd been stopped at every single corridor and every single corner along the way by someone wanting to talk to them about the session the prior day, telling them how wonderful it was, how much they got from it, ideas, inspiration and so forth. So they were a little bit peeved, but they were also very glad that the the, uh, the session had been so engaging. And that for me, uh, without wanting to sound too kind of sickly about it, that is is a, a fabulous thing to to um, to experience and to enjoy. And just to be able to be a small part of that is um, is really, really nice for, uh, for everyone in our team, I think. So today is going to look like this, folks. We will get a handle on, on the problem, okay? You have challenges out there. You face issues that make you feel uncomfortable, uh, maybe stressed, maybe anxious at times. So we'll paint a broad picture around how uh, those feelings come about. And then what you'll hear today is three specific situations faced by real people just like you in the last two to three years that we've been able to help with. And you'll see what happened in each case, how the shopper was central to the outcome. And then you'll see what learnings you can take from each case. We'll start with something fairly common, very common challenge, the D-list conversation. Okay, it's um, it's something that no one really wants to have uh, on either side of the table, generally speaking. Um, but if you work in our industry long enough, you are bound, I would say, to eventually uh, face into that conversation. Then after that, we will look at a location conundrum. Andrew's gonna take us through that one. And finally, It'll feel a little bit more from the strategic end of things um, with that scenario around joint planning that I just mentioned earlier. Now, very quick disclaimer before we go any further. Uh, Andrew and I are not going to be talking dollar values. We're not going to be talking about ROIs or anything of that sort. I know some folks like to make those things up because they think that it adds credibility, but generally it doesn't. And generally speaking, those figures, if they were quoted, wouldn't be relevant to you, wouldn't be relevant to your situation anyway. So we're focusing today on the learnings and on the principles. Or um, if you've read uh, Andrew Clear's book, Atomic Habits, to use his language, we're focusing on the systems, not the goals. Get the systems and the process right, and your specific goals will follow. The other thing we've done, of course, today is we've anonymized. We're not getting down into specific category uh names and so forth uh and we're not naming names today either so everything's been anonymous so that we can focus on those principles now um thank you to those of you who have uh chipped in already talk chris said talking to uh, customers what else have we got here uh narrowly insights into strategy and actions 
Um, we've had a bunch of stuff, actually. Giving shoppers uh, opportunity at shelf. Like it. Like it. Creating synergies. This is this is good language. Creating synergies between uh, retailers and suppliers. So thank you very much. You're obviously involved already. Keep it up. Uh, we've got, uh, I think we've got a whole bunch of people from the Shopper Intelligence team uh, on the call today. Ming definitely is there. Uh, perhaps drop us a hi in the, in the chat, Ming, if you haven't already. Uh, stick all your comments, questions, ideas into the chat. Get it all out of your system and get it all into that chat. Um, Ming will be there to answer little bits and pieces as we go along. And uh, hopefully if we have time towards the end, we will dig in to uh, a couple of those uh, interesting questions as we go. And as is always the case, I had a couple of questions already. The recording will indeed be available within about 24 hours or so. Okay, hopefully that makes sense so far. Uh, um, keep going with the thumbs up if that's what you're expecting. I hope it was. Then we will crack on. So we need we need some sort of, we don't need a problem, but we need to articulate a problem. What is it that stresses people like you and me out out there? Well, Generally speaking, in one way, shape or form, your goal is uh, to get your plans and get your ideas adopted, right? Whether you're a retailer or supplier, uh, internal, ex external audience, doesn't really matter. You want to influence an outcome. And to do that, you have to sell something to someone at some point, an idea, a proposal, a strategy. And here's where the stress has traditionally come about, especially if you're an account lead or a marketeer, or an insights expert, or even a head of category. So this level one, level two thinking, sophisticated selling, parallel thinking, essentially, they're all about you. They're about your brand. They're about your targets, your goals. And then you apply some sort of, some level or some degree of category thinking at some stage, but it's really there to appease. It's not really there to add value. And as a result, it feels like you are selling in rather than getting buy-in from your trading partner, from your reseller. And that's the stressful part because it feels like you're selling. It feels uncomfortable perhaps, and you feel like you could be doing a better job. So at level three there, over on the right-hand side, that's when you bake in the category thinking from the start and you begin to see this buy-in from your trading partners, from your retailers. And the centerpiece of that plan is shopper behavior, shoppers' needs, shoppers' expectations. Okay, that's what gets you the tick. That, that's how we start to talk in these terms of elevating performance, reaching goals, not by obsessing over that goal and that brand, but actually by putting the shopper at the heart of your conversation. So level three is a goal. It's not a guarantee, okay? There's no guarantees in life, or very few anyway, that if you get there, uh, all the doors will open, all the doors will be unlocked. But uh, it certainly is a worthy aspiration and very few people are operating there all of the time. So a quick poll. I just want to gauge the mood out there right now. Where do you believe your business spends uh, the majority of its time today? Level one, sophisticated selling. Level two, parallel thinking. Or level three, joined up planning. I'm going to let that run for a few moments whilst we uh, move things forward into our first uh, use case, our first scenario. So remember, this is about elevating performance. We're talking systems, we're talking processes, and we're trying to derive the key learnings that you can take from these situations. Everything we talk about today then is aimed and targeted at that level three space. Getting buy-in, even when you might be starting from a place of disagreement with your trading partners. So we're going to start with that common scenario. Common situation, um, often perhaps viewed as, as quite a tactical conversation. It's the D-list. Uh, the word no account manager uh, wants to hear. You don't want to get that call on a Friday afternoon, um, but it happens. And you might use words like fighting for space or defending our position, uh, which really belies the, the 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 sentiment and the emotions beneath this. It's it's a combat. It's adversarial, and in many cases, there will be an awful lot at stake. So it might very well look like going into battle. Uh, and this is where a, um, a client of ours about three years ago now, a liquor client, liquor supplier, came to us, somewhat disheartened, uh, perhaps a little bit despondent. 
And this was because the D-list of a major line uh, was being tabled by one of their key retail customers. Potentially very, very, very damaging news for this business. And the broad argument went that uh, the brand in question had two similar SKUs, a litre product and a 700 mil version, and removing the smaller one, 700 mil, wouldn't impact the category all that, that much because the argument went that the two products were largely substitutable, interchangeable with one another. Okay, literally millions, if not tens of millions of dollars at stake. So there was an approach that we took, and there's an approach that you can consider in situations like this. The key to addressing this situation, or indeed any similar situation, is to address the underlying assumptions being made. In this case, there were three core assumptions uh, that were being made by the retailer. Uh, around usage, around occasions, around spend. And when we explored what shoppers in the banner were really saying, that was when we were able to table uh, three alternatives, three truths, in fact, as they were. And for each, there were evidently, uh, there was a proof point or multiple proof points to support that alternative perspective. Now, obviously, this is a distillation of a much, much bigger piece of work. But just to walk you through it, the assumption was that that uh, there was a very similar shopper buying both formats and using that product uh, for very similar occasions. The reality was quite the opposite. Two very different shopper profiles and two very different usages. And the proof of that came in the data, which was the product X over indexed. In the younger demographics, 18 to 34s, uh, product Y actually over-indexed in over 55s. And it was an, a younger audience, younger uh, shopper that was using product X much more for celebration, for party occasions, uh, whereas product Y and the older shopper were stocking up with the, um, the other product. So that mentality, that rationale ran through the, the whole course of um, this playback and this uh, and this discussion. Now, ultimately, just to tell you where this went, the, the approach really helped to get a more constructive conversation going. Um, it took away some of that defensive nature of the discussion in the first place. The product is still there today. Uh, it's, uh, it's very much still alive and well. And more than that, this, uh, this supplier has started to build a platform as a collaborative part partner because in part of the approach that it took here. It's, it's openness, it's determination, it's willingness to step into that joint planning uh, phase and to consider this from a category perspective. Now, takeouts wise, um, a lot of takeouts here, but I tried to distill these down into th three very simple things. The first, of course, is to be led by the shopper, not by the brand. OK, that was very evident, hopefully, in the in the slide I just showed you. But throughout this process, this is how it was positioned. This is how the brand wanted to go into the discussion. And they wanted to talk about why this was going to be damaging for the shopper. Of course, we were able to uh, to shop uh, to shop to uh, to demonstrate that as well. And we shopped for some for some good data to support that. Um, speaking of data, though, the second key takeout here is that this was not about spreadsheets this fundamentally wasn't really about numbers 32 percent of this 64 percent of that what this was about was about building a compelling story okay taking the retailer on a journey um, obviously the data supported it and you could see some of those highlights within what i showed you just now but this wasn't really about values uh, it wasn't dollar values it wasn't cases it wasn't any of that sort of stuff it was actually about leading with a shopper and telling a compelling story about the way that this retailer's shoppers actually behaved in the category. And the third thing really then just flowed out of that. We talked and the supplier was able to talk category outcomes. So we took away that defensiveness. They took away that um, sort of antagonism and that, that uh, language of, of battle and talked much more about how we together can build a strong category and how 
we can um, uh, we can look to data to support uh, a compelling case for that product. So uh, I was just going to touch just before we move on uh, the poll. I will close it now, and uh, you should be able to see what the um, the results are coming up on your screen. Ah, it will be if I share them anyway. So. Uh, 33% of you out there today say you are in the sophisticated selling space and your business is a lot of the time, 50% in parallel thinking and 18% in joined up planning most of the time. Okay, great. Wonderful. You're in the right place. Uh, shared one, one opportunity, one way to deal with a tricky situation and to try and approach it from more of that joined up planning perspective rather than the old fashioned sophisticated selling. So wherever you are, it's not a bad thing. Wherever you are is the right place for you today. And you have the opportunity to move forward and spend just 1%, 2%, 3% more of your time in the next phase along. It's going to have massive benefit for you and for your performance and elevating where you're trying to get to. Okay. I'm going to have a little sip of water and we're going to go into uh, number two. I'm going to hand over to Andrew. And this is uh, a location question, Andrew. Tell us more. Yes, it is. So... This, excuse me, this particular conundrum that we had um, with this uh, supplier was really based around the fact that there were multiple locations in store and there was a push from the retailer to actually consolidate these locations together. Now, the, the, real, the real thing about that, though, is that the supplier in question didn't actually know what they should do. Should they actually push back against this or should they actually try to influence the end result if it was actually going to end up being just the one central location? Now, that they were worried. Now, let's be pretty frank about this. They were worried about what would happen to them if they were not able to influence the process at all. There were some genuine concerns there. But what this really boiled down to, when you sort of distill away all the sort of questions and everything else that was going on here, is that well, we had a situation where neither the retailer nor the shopper really understood what the shopper actually wanted in this situation. So again, as with David's example that he's just run through, there were some assumptions that we needed to work our way through. And now these assumptions were more or less actually being held by the retailer, but to a certain extent, they were being held by the supplier as well. So that first assumption that, that was being held was that there were different locations in store for this particular category, but the shoppers were actually using them in the same manner, that there was no difference between the two of them. When we actually started getting down into the nitty gritty of everything, that actually came out pretty nice and clearly that uh, the shopper had a different mindset. They were using those locations for different reasons, for different occasionality, for different modes of shopping. One location was being used for a main shop, so that obviously a main shop shopper has different needs, different uh, levels of importance on different things. Different things matter to them when you're on a main shop. And another location was being used for top-up shopping more than anything else. So that's where occasionally started coming into play. And again, a top-up shopper is different to a main, a main shop shopper. They need different things. They're looking for different things. Different things excite them and interest them. The second assumption was, about, was also held that it didn't actually really matter about there being multiple locations. Shoppers weren't really too worried about either one of them. They were pretty happy, you know, that, that sort of kind of mindset. But again, when you actually got under the hood and had a look at it, they were not very happy whatsoever. They were confused about where things should be in store because there was dual location on a number of, of products across the store. So we could actually drill down to that and understand that, you know, shoppers were confused about where things should be. And the reason we did that, we had a look at a metric called importance of location. That was quite high and it was being significantly under-delivered to expectation. Shoppers were not happy about location. They, they were confused about what should be where, um, what role each location should play. It was quite clear when looking through the, uh, through the data. And the third assumption, and this is actually quite relevant even now, obviously, the third assumption was all about price was really a significant factor in this category. This one was quite an easy one to actually to debunk because it came through quite clearly that you couldn't have been further from the truth in regards to price being a significant factor in this category. It was a background factor at best. There was just a few things, you know, that were far more important than price in this category. Occasion was far more important a factor for shoppers in this category. Premiumization 
was really, really key. Price knowledge was actually quite low. The shopper didn't really know what they were paying in the first place. So, you know, a heavily promoted category didn't need to be heavily promoted, that, that kind of thing. When you have a shopper that doesn't really know the price of something, promotions can actually have quite limited value. You still need to do them, but they're not going to have you know, the same sort of effect as, as if a shopper really knows what price they're paying in the first place because it just doesn't have the same sort of impact. And the final thing that came through really strongly in this was the role of segments within this category was incredibly strong and they were incredibly varied as well. This was not a case where you could simply say one size fits all. You absolutely could not do that in this category at all. And there's no and, better you, actually sorry, illustrate- no. I was just going to say, just before we move on to that, just because I, I think this is a fascinating point, don't you, about price, um, price significance or price importance. Uh, something I'm, I'm hearing and seeing a lot, particularly in liquor at the moment, is, um, should we say, a determination to, to position price as the most important factor, bar none, across all shoppers and all categories. And, and actually, that's not necessarily taking into account sort of genuine market realities, as your example demonstrates here. Price importance is high, but it's on a sliding scale from category one to category 150. And there are so many other factors that can play a significant role. Yeah, and, and that's what we saw in this category too. It's a, it's not enough to simply know that that a shopper thinks price is important. If you're not actually comparing that with something, with, with all the other categories, you don't know how important that that level of price importance is relative to other categories. It could yeah. well be that it really matters. It could well be that actually, no, you just have to tick the box and move on to other things that shoppers actually have put way more stock in. And, and that, yeah. that plays up in this category for sure. And the, the segmentation piece, I think, really sort of demonstrated here that you could not apply a cookie cutter approach to this particular category. So this actually became very important in the end because the decision was made to actually centralize into one location. But what this particular chart sh showed is that one segment was completely different to another, was completely different to a third, was completely different to a fourth. If you had simply applied the actual shopper dynamics from just what the category itself was, you would have missed a trick because Segment A, as you can see there, is completely different to segment B, is completely different to segment C, is completely different to segment D, and so on and so on. This category required to have a significant level of shopper-led layout methodology applied to it when this decision was made to centralize into one place. Mm -hmm. So what actually really happened uh, in, this, in this scenario? Well, the big thing was, like I said, it actually came to the point that one location was actually used um, but the point is, is that the client was able to influence how that one location actually ended up looking like. So the first big takeout really from, from, from this process was that you need to understand that different locations will serve different masters. I mean, it, and that applies if you have a permanent location and temporary locations. It applies if you have more than one permanent location within the store. Those different locations serve different roles for the, for the shopper. They will shop them differently. They will have different needs in most different locations. The second piece for this was that you really needed to build a story. Again, it wasn't just taking a data point. It wasn't taking a series of data points to the retailer and saying, you know, you should do X, Y, Z, you know, because it says this, this, and this. It was about building in the narrative that, okay, we're on board with the decision to do what you want to do, but help us shape the way that should look. So making that like, what's such location fit for purpose. And how do they do that? They took a shopper. And they took an occasion-led methodology and mentality into that. If the central location had not had this applied, then it would have been a disaster for everybody. But the fact is that the supplier was able to influence that and actually get some wins out of it as well. So it wasn't it wasn't a case of what they feared at the beginning that maybe was a, oh, I have to make the best of a bad situation. It was actually, you know what, the situation can actually be used and we can actually get something really strong out of it. And they ended up doing that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so powerful. So, so powerful. And I, uh, as you've called out there, I mean, the, the context is is incredibly important, just as you, you've you identified, uh, Andrew, on the slide there, is, is how you have to get into that level of detail. You can't, well, you can, but it's unwise to assume that segment A is the same as segment B, just because 
um, just because category X happens to to fall somewhere within that that grid. And then on top of that, you've got that relativity that you talked about. Uh, and finally, you've got this. Remember, what? why are we doing all this? We're doing this because we want to try and get buy in. We don't want to be selling in. We don't want to be pushing water uphill. So that component around the story, uh, which which trumps really the data points, which trumps whether it's 64 or this or 32 or that, it's the story that you can weave together. And it's fair to say, isn't it, Andrew, you, you've got other data sources out there. Um, clearly, you've got a, a complex ecosystem of data uh, and data inputs. What you need really to try and do is make sure that you can uh, meld them together into a coherent and compelling story. Synthesis uh, really, um, as well as the initial analysis that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the final point I would make out of that before we move on is that this situation, and I'm sure this is this is true for, for a lot of situations that you have between suppliers and retailers, this had the potential to get quite adversarial. But taking the approach that the supplier did turned this into a joint solution. It didn't, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a case of, oh, we'll just make them do this or try to force them to do this. It was a case of, how can we work together? How can we actually make something really, really good out of something which could potentially have been quite antagonistic? Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so two down, one to go, folks. Uh, hopefully you're uh, you're getting the value, you're seeing how you can use this. Quick one before we leave locations behind. If you'd like us to share a little bonus with you after this session, just type location in the chat now. We'll send you uh, top 10 categories bought on secondary space for both Australia worlds and people click off the mark. Susie, I haven't even finished the sentence. <laughs> That's what everyone was waiting for. Okay, terrific. So if you haven't already, location in the chat now, and we will send you top 10 categories uh, plus a few selected others. So you can see if yours is in there or not. Uh, if it's not, give us a shout and um, see if we can tell you where it is. Um, and we will send you that little bonus content. I think we're going to be sending uh, sending a lot of those out, which is fantastic. Now, uh, two quite different use cases so far, possibly more at that kind of tactical end of the spectrum. So we're going to finish things off with a more strategic uh, deployment, but still a real example. So this is from about 18 months ago. Um, and this time we're looking at joint business planning. OK, the, the JBP, the JCP, a critical time for your business uh, and for anyone that's involved, and as you will well know, if you've been through it, uh, it can generate an awful lot of stress, it can make you feel uh, quite anxious because there is, again, a huge amount riding on it. And often there is this fear um, that if it goes wrong, if it goes badly, that heads are going to roll, heads could be on the chopping block. Um, whether or not that is the case, that's that's how it feels a lot of the time. And that is, um, and that's what makes it real. That's why you need a, a, a solution, a process to get through that. Now, our protagonists in this case weren't necessarily as concerned as that, but they were definitely, I would say, anxious to get a good result. So they hadn't been in this position before. They hadn't had this level of planning opportunity with this retailer. Uh, I, I don't think ever, but it's certainly been many, many years, if it had been at all. So they desperately, desperately wanted to make a good impression and they wanted to show what their team could do. So the other important thing to underscore there um, is that, that their team um, had plenty of brand plans and ideas. OK, there was no shortage of ideas and proposals and innovations that they wanted to put on the table. But the point was they were super motivated uh, not to get stuck in the old sophisticated selling mindset, the old trap of, look at all this great stuff we've got. All you need is our brands. We're going to win the category single-handedly for you. They wanted to front up differently. And so the solution here revolved around three important levers, uh, understanding, collaboration, and action planning. So we used a workshop that uh, workshop model that we've replicated many, many times, it's usually about a half day. And it's designed uh, really to get everyone in the room uh, to leave with a common understanding, first of all, of their key category drivers. So we look at things like category DNA. We look at things like shopper satisfaction levels. Uh, we look at key path to purchase triggers. 
there is deliberately relatively little tell from the front of the room. This is an important part of the, the collaboration uh, aspect. We don't want to be sitting there telling anybody what to think uh, for the whole day. What we want is for much more group discussion so that people can share their ideas and their thinking. That's what you want to be able to do. If you're spending three hours with a key customer, you want to have that conversation time. But it's also very important that it's action orientated. Okay, so each section of the day requires some assessment by participants and a mini action plan. And that action plan then, in fact, gets consolidated into a final takeaway um, at the end of the day so that everyone is aligned on what's happening next as a, at a team level and also at an individual level. So that was really the setup. Um, three ingredients beneath all that that are incredibly important if you're in this situation and you need to make that solid impression show what you're capable of firstly uh, of course you need to get the right people in the room senior levels preferably cross-functional have all of the players in the room and you need a good facilitator okay so if you're going to spend three or four hours sitting in a room you don't just want to be staring at each other wondering what it's all about you need somebody who can guide you and take you and help you on that journey. Second important thing here is good structure. This isn't an information overload. This isn't a data fest. It's about the critical data that you need to inform thinking. So it needs to be targeted. And the whole thing has to be, as I said, action orientated and actionable. No good walking away at the end of it and people pondering what they did with their day. It certainly wasn't the case in this um, situation, as I mentioned right at the start. Um, people left with a lot of food for thought. They left excited, engaged, and determined to move things forward based on what they'd heard that day. And last but not least, whatever inputs you take in there, and there are many that you can take in there, they need to be credible. They need to be an honest reflection of reality because, again, we're trying to get into buy-in territory. And a holistic view is what you need to cover it. In this session, we were able to tackle uh, multiple categories in the same session. We were able to break down by different retailers so that the group could compare and contrast. They could see the differences for themselves in the way shoppers behaved and perceived the categories and really see for themselves how different those behaviours were. I'll just very briefly give you a quick example of what that looked like, distilling a half-day workshop into one slide. So... We talk about the path to purchase, we talk about purchase triggers, and we talk about what it is that people in different retailers and categories plan to buy. So this was information that we presented on the day. And you can see very, very clearly how the shopper in retailer A and retailer B differ very distinctly. In retailer B, they're shopping this particular category much more as a regular purchase. They're much more open to pre-store advertising. So straight away, you're starting to think about the strategic, the tactical levers. It's much more about reminding the shopper in retailer B not to run out, keep it stocked up, keep it on hand, but do so in pre-store advertising. Uh, and then below that, it's very important to know and understand the differentials as far as what was planned. So brand we see in both cases, very, very powerful. So brand focus comms make a lot of sense. But then beneath that, we've got two very, very distinct differences. We've got a shopper in retailer A that's focused much more on type, the type of product that they can get in the category. And yet in, um, excuse me, in, in retailer B and in shop in retailer A, that shopper is much more orientated towards planning around what is the best price in the category. So very, very clearly, uh, two different comm strategies, different levels of in-store versus pre-store emphasis and this was the kind of information that allowed this retailer and this supplier to start to evolve and develop their strategies and their comms in order to elevate performance in the category. A huge number of, of benefits uh, and, and outcomes, positive outcomes that came out of this. We've had lots of people from, um, from our supplier clients reach out to us since then and tell us, how they benefited from it, how they enjoyed it. One of the key comments I think really was how they thought that this was a good use of time. Uh, the balance between the data, the insights, the conversation worked because it gave them the opportunity to discuss. It wasn't just a, a, a tell. 
And if you ever remember sitting in class at school, there was a lot of tell. So that didn't tell us why I don't remember much of what I did at school or university. Um, one of the best ever joint business planning sessions, that's how um, senior execs on both sides uh, referred to it. And I spoke to even the, um, the buyer from the retailer not that long ago, and he talked about how this session was the catalyst and a key catalyst, not only for uh, a, a step change in terms of category performance for his business, but also um, how it step changed and propelled the supplier and the, um, and the brand into a new place as far as uh, collaboration and category thinking was concerned. So the three big takeouts from this one, developing that shared view of the category. This is the essence of that buy-in territory, understanding in a collective manner the opportunities and the, and the truth, if you like, of the category. Uh, number two is just spending quality time. If you can encourage your trading partners to spend three, three, three and a half, four hours with you, I would say you're on the path to strengthening relationships. Obviously, though, you want to get the right content, the right structure, the right messages in play on that day. And number three, you have to leave with an action plan. Do this without that, and it's probably going to end up being, being somewhat detrimental, actually, to your, to your performance. But get that action plan going. Align on the priorities, align on the next steps, and you're going to be in a much better place to start moving forward on performance. So, folks, we are just about up on 40 minutes. I'm having a quick squeeze through uh, questions. I can see a lot of locations. Um, thank you, Johnny. Location, location, location. Uh, love it. Uh, Steve, thank you. What else have we got? Um, I'm just trying to find. I saw one question. Bear with me for a minute, folks. Um, not that, that's data. Right, pop in here, see if I've got anything. Uh, I think we've covered it pretty much. I'm going to uh, going to go straight on, folks. We've got a little checklist. Ultimately, it, this is about the buy-in, not the sell-in. Put the shopper at the heart of the conversation, and you, you are going to find that you move up towards that joint planning space, and you will in in, uh, invariably move away from sophisticated selling. Uh, bear in mind that every situation is different. Uh, uh, as I said, in liquor in particular, I'm hearing a lot of sort of um, broad brush conversations around price. Now is the time really to be diving deeper for the context in and around your category. You're looking for insights that will help you pinpoint those specific actions. And you need sometimes to look outside of your immediate space in order to do that. And last but not least, as we've said a few times, shop is not a project. Um, my um, my uh, metaphor was if you go to the gym uh, and you do squats today, you've never done squats before, it's going to hurt. It's probably going to hurt a lot. If you do it week after week after week, that repetition builds muscle memory and ultimately that's the route to better performance. So, Andrew, uh, quickly, mate, one thing uh, that you take away, what's the call to action, big takeout for anyone who's not necessarily working with Shop Intelligence doesn't have access to uh, to our program at the moment? Well, certainly for the people that, that we're not currently working with, I mean, basically, just put a yes in the comments if you want to talk to us about, you know, what's going on in your, in your businesses at the moment, you know, what's happening with categories, what's happening with your retailers, and, and we can reach out to you, we can help you, we can give you some guidance on what you want to do. So if you if, if we don't work with you currently, we want to see a yes in the comments, and then we can start that conversation with you. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I can see if US is coming in now, which is terrific. Keep coming. Got a few more seconds to go. Thank you, um, Chris, Elaine, Rowan. Um, now, obviously, we've got a very varied audience on the line today. And if you are already using shopping zones, if your business does already have access to this information, these insights, reach out to us. We are here to help you, uh, myself and the team, and um, as well as uh, Andrew and Dan in, in New Zealand. No matter what your challenges are, whether they're any of the ones that we touched on today, um, anything you're currently facing into, remember, it's not a project. It's a day-in, day-out experience. Take this opportunity to reach out to your insights uh, lead. Talk to us today, and we will help you on that journey to putting shoppers at the heart of your plans and elevating your performance.
more yes is coming in. I want to thank everyone for uh, for your time. Appreciate your commitment this morning to the session. I uh, hope you found some value. Keep in touch with us. Have a terrific day, folks, and we will see you all again very soon. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody.